show me love you either sending me comments you're sending me donations that shit keeps me afloat guys i really appreciate it that's why you are the first to see this exclusive drop and i'm excited about this drop specifically today because this reminds me of the fake pyramids of shit drop shit Man, that joint. Um, for me it was just uh it just unlocked so many keys to letting us know exactly where the land is. Um, and really that was just the culmination of a lot of knowledge coming in together. And really it says and speaks volumes about um, our new understanding of scripture. So with that being said, I'm here to debunk all the charlatans talking about Babylon, the Tower of Babylon is over there in the middle of a rock over there between the Tigris and Euphrates River. Now, these are the people who are accepted all over the world as the professionals, as the people who know it all. Now, when they're doing these elaborate archaeological excavations in Babylon that cost hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, and then they're shipping all of these artifacts over to Germany, to the Louvre in the case of Egypt. So what happens is there is already an established narrative. It is similar to uh, Thompson's stage theory, the Stone Age, the Ice Age, or Stone Age, Ice Age, Stone Age, Bronze Age, and um, Iron Age. So they're already set upon a certain standard of thinking when they get this information and move it forward. So there is already an established geography. Now, most of you guys have been following me long enough to know that we've very effectively debunked the old world versus new world geography. So um, if you're just a person who happens to be uh, new to this information, I would suggest you watch videos like The Art of Atheism is a really good one. Um, it really gives you the, I would say, the foundational information. And then moving on down the road, that's when we get into the holy eyes. So if you Start watching The Art of Atheism and you get into the Holy Heist, you can see exactly how and why I say and know that we are on ancient Holy Land. When I say ancient Holy Land, Israel, Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, all that. It's not over there. It's over here. And I can prove it. And I've done it several times as other people have. Now, the cool thing about this is I'm going to be using scripture and I'm also going to be using charlatan science, all the science they've developed and think that they know stuff, but it's really interesting how these Magogites conveniently leave out certain things when it doesn't fit their narratives. And we're talking about things that effectively make or break the case for Babylon. So um, it's, it's funny because I'm going to be able to do a lot of the same stuff that I did in the pyramids video. I'm going to quote some of these uh, charlatan documentaries and I'm going to make fun of them. So I am going to be uh, using footage, just, just a couple of clips from other documentaries to show you the levels of just fuckery that this fake history and science is set upon. And I'm going to be making fun of them. So if for any reason YouTube pulls this video, you are going to be getting it via, uh, you're going to be getting it via Google Drive. So, um, you know, anybody who's on this email list, I do have your email. You'll be able to watch it on Google Drive if for any reason YouTube decides to fuck with me. So just just strap up because I got a lot of I got a lot of shit to talk to the charlatans and about the charlatans. We're going to first look at the Tower of Babylon and its secret location because these guys claim to have found it where it's supposed to be right there in Iraq. Now, we're going to go back through, we're going to do a quick review of the stuff that we've discussed before in terms of, I would say, maybe the top five things 
that makes America the Holy Land. And then I'm going to keep it moving because I've, I've listed hundreds. And then I'm going to effectively lay out some new cases as we start to uh, identify some of the waterways. Now, specifically, when I'm talking about the waterways, in, in terms of how it plays between the relationship of Babylon and Egypt, I'm specifically talking about the Great River. Okay, the Great River being the Mississippi. Okay, so the Mississippi River is the Euphrates, or what some would call the Nile. But understand that in Scripture, there is no Nile. Okay, the Nile, the word Nile is a generic term used for any tributary brook or stream of a much larger river. And you also have to understand that the way that America looks at rivers isn't the way that the old world looked at rivers. So each river wasn't necessarily each little stream or tributary. Sometimes a river was huge. Sometimes in the case of the Mississippi, it was multiple rivers. And I'm going to be able to show you this and you're going to see the Mississippi watershed. And you're also going to be able to see the St. Lawrence River watershed. And we're going to talk about exactly what has been found in that area that could possibly identify these locations as an ancient Babylon. And then we're going to look in to chronology and the fallacy that certain people were even civilized were even civilized beyond a certain point during a certain time. So we're going to challenge a lot of their theories. Um, and this video, like I said, is going to be a little bit different because what I plan on doing, I'm going to do a little bit on the board, okay? Then I'm going to have to show you the map. So you'll be getting a, you'll be getting a little bit of both. You'll be getting me face to face. I'm going to go to the map. Um, I also want to make sure that initially, before we even get into this, so that we have a real um, academic approach to this material in general, I'm going to read from Scripture so we know exactly what we should be looking for as it pertains to the Tower of Babel and to the location of the Tower of Babel. So there's only a few clues. You can go through different books. You only really have Genesis to look at. So we're going to have to look at some extra canonical materials such as the book of Jubilees and the book of Jasher. And there are two different stories as to what these texts say happened to the Tower of Babylon. Jubilees says one thing. Jasher says another thing. But before we even get into those texts, we're going to take all of the other canonized texts and we're going to look through all of the references as to what the location of Babel is. Now, it's generally thought that Babel is in Mesopotamia, which I found out. Yes, it seems as though Babel is in Mesopotamia. Here is the issue. There is no exact location as to what the scripture points to as to where it is. Okay, now there are ominous descriptions of the remnants which I have been able to identify on earth. So you'll be able to know at the end of the video exactly where on earth is the Tower of Babel and I welcome anyone to challenge me because for me, it's not about being right. I mean, it's not about me being right. It's about knowing what's true. So I'm presenting this argument for anyone out there to challenge me. Tell me that it's on the other side of the world or tell me it's here in a better location. Okay, but I have used a lot of what I've learned over these past few years to develop my own theory about the location of Babylon, and I think it'll be quite compelling. So at the end of this, you're going to see a clear place on earth where I think the Tower of Babylon once stood. Let's go! Get me dead in my So in 1902, and I want you to imagine this, you found Babylon, you found the Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar. It was a momentous find. And so a series of lectures were conducted in 1902, and they were called Babel and the Bible. And it was all about this great discovery in Babylon and how these artifacts support the evidence of the Bible.
Mesopotamia, the country between two rivers. The name given by the Greeks and Romans to the region between the Euphrates and the Tigris. This is all to give you a little bit of context. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you a current map of where Mesopotamia is. And I'm also going to cross reference it with a later or earlier map that I had produced where I said I thought Mesopotamia was. So what we're going to do here is use a lot of ancient artifacts. And I would like to thank my friend Harry Hubbard for making these discoveries up there in the Ohio Valley, little Egypt area in Illinois, Ohio and Missouri. I appreciate you, Harry, because what you've been able to do is crack a lot of this deception that has been hidden for generations. So I'm going to show you where Mesopotamia is on the map. And like I said before, this this meso prefix right here is huge. Now, the land between two rivers in this case, in our case, we're going to look at the Mississippi watershed. Now, if you notice here, the Mississippi watershed is humongous. You'll notice tons of rivers. If you just look at the mouth down at the Gulf of Mexico, you'll notice that it goes all the way as far west as the Rocky Mountains. I need you guys to understand that all of those rivers are the Mississippi or the Euphrates. Okay, so the Mississippi River literally is the Arkansas River, the Canadian River, the Smoky Hill River, the Platte River, the North Platte River, the Missouri River, the Ohio River, the Tennessee River, the Cumberland River, the Illinois River, the Wisconsin River. Okay, it's all these rivers. So the way these rivers work are just how nature works. The path of least resistance. How does a river work? Waters flow to the lowest part of the earth. And what do you know? The Most High has created its own natural filtration system to collect, disperse, and keep water flowing. And if you'll notice, all of these places around the world, dams control water supplies. Even furthermore, if any man were to build a dam in the early 1800s or 1900s, you were able to control water supply down river. Anyone who is down river is at the helm and or control of whoever lives up river. We really have no idea how massive the Mississippi River is because there's a million dams and each dam stops the natural course of water from flowing. Now you're asking yourself, why are they building these dams? They're building these dams to control the water supply. Not only that, to control power supply, hydroelectric power. But if you control water supply, then you have impact on revenue, on institutions. You have impact on land. You have impact on the livelihood of people. For anyone who knows the current map, uh, they know that the mouths of these rivers uh, both in, in the Persian Gulf. And how does the Persian Gulf relate to what scripture says about the locations of the mouths of those rivers? These are things that these uh, well-seasoned paleontologists, archaeologists, they just seem to leave out. It's like, hey, you know, I found this rock and it's got, you know, it's got Nebuchadnezzar's name on it and Babylon. This must be Babylon. But rivers are missing. Um, it's just interesting how they pay attention to certain things but they don't pay attention to other things. So biblical context has a lot to do with which where you're gonna understand the land. Now, it's first mentioned in Genesis, but even going further, it's also in Deuteronomy, Judges, Chronicles, and also the Book of Kings. 
Um, I'm just going to read from BibleReference.com just to give us a little more context. Mesopotamia, the country between two rivers. The name given by the Greeks and Romans to the region between the Euphrates and the Tigris. Okay. In the Old Testament, it is mentioned under the name Padan Aram, the plain of Aram or Syria. The northern portion of this fertile plateau was the original home of the ancestors of the Hebrews. Now, earlier I mentioned punching holes in these heathen theories, especially these new modern fake academics who don't really read scripture. And once you understand the deception behind the narrative that they push, which is a false narrative, in order to prop certain knowledge or certain information as truth. So once you understand what they're doing, then you have a utter disdain for their lack of research when it comes to scripture. Because a lot of the context that these guys claim that they really know innately is right there in scripture. So the fact that they could go over to Babylon and Iraq on that side of the world and claim that that's Holy Land is completely as a nine, as a 10, as a 13. So if we just look at the Euphrates versus the Nile, remember how I said earlier, the Euphrates is identified as the great river. Okay. There is one river and then you have the Nile brooks, streams, and tributaries. Now, the deception comes in the translations. If you were going to read, let's say, a new international version, it's going to say one thing. And then let's say you read a King James version, it's going to say another thing. So, for example, there are occurrences when the word Euphrates is brought up or the word Parath. And then there are times when the Nile is brought up, or the word Yeor. Now, this literally means two different things. The Nile is a generic term for a brook, a stream, or a tributary. Okay? The Euphrates is the river. For example, Isaiah 19 6 you'll see multiple versions here and you'll notice that it says the streams of Egypt and the brooks of Egypt and the streams of Egypt right there under what is supposed to be the Nile Yeor Bayor Hayor 25 occurrences 7 occurrences for Bayor now if we go over here to the Euphrates, 14 occurrences for the word parat. Genesis 2.14, and the fourth river is Euphrates. Let's go back over to Isaiah. By the Nile, by the brooks in King James. What? So when you say the Nile, you are saying a brook, stream, or tributary, which essentially, which essentially means that they singularized a plural noun or a pluralized word. If you understand what I'm saying, they took creek, creeks, or streams of and turned it into the. That's the deception of language. So right there, if we just look at that, we can know 100% fact that they just created a river in Africa and called it the Nile, number one. Because when we go look at the original context of the scripture, the Nile stands for stream. Furthermore, the Euphrates, 
whose mouth is at the Egyptian Sea. But I thought the mouth of the Euphrates was the Persian Gulf. How can the Persian Gulf be the U Egyptian Sea? How is that possible? According to scripture, the mouth of the Euphrates is at the Egyptian Sea. Yet the Euphrates in Iraq flows into the Persian Gulf. Meanwhile, they have an entire whole river in Africa called the Nile. And the Nile is an improper noun. Also pluralized. Houseway. These are simple contextual bullet points that these pseudo intellectuals routinely miss. How is that so? So with this information, I can just further confirm beyond a shadow of a doubt that they do not know what they're talking about. You can come to this channel, you can watch this video, and you can be skeptical, but there it is. I urge you to go pick up an older version. Go pick up a 1549 Tyndale Bible and let me know what it says when it comes to the context and the meaning of the word Nile versus what it really means versus what you understand it to mean. There's not two great rivers. The Nile being a generic term was named after the Greek river god. Nelios. And it just so happened that Egyptian culture is closely related to Greek mythology and Babylonian mythology. Imagine that. Nelios was the Greek name for the river Nile. Oh, Nelios was the Greek name for the river Nile. But how is that possible? You know why? Because they just called the river Nile. They call it the Nile. That doesn't mean that it is the actual Nile because we know Nile was a plural form of a tributary, brook or stream. And that doesn't necessarily imply that it's a brook, tributary, or stream of the Euphrates, nonetheless. Sixty-five mentions of the word the Nile. Hayor, under its most common mention. Now with the word Euphrates, you've been double mind fucked into an illegitimate location, Iraq. Getting a little closer to the Tower of Babel, we're going to take a more detailed look at the St. Lawrence River. So I'm just gonna be reading from Wikipedia. The St. Lawrence River, the Mohawk call it the Kia Tawa meaning big waterway, is a large river in the middle latitudes of North America. The St. Lawrence River flows in a roughly northeasterly direction connecting the Great Lakes with the Atlantic Ocean and forming the primary drainage outflow of the Great Lakes Basin. It traverses Canadian provinces, Quebec and Ontario and acts as the border between Canada and New York. The Norse explored the Gulf of St. Lawrence in the early 11th century. So they're saying that the Norse had already come to the Gulf of St. Lawrence most likely the Vikings or their cousins or some shit, possibly. 
The first European explorer known to have sailed up the St. Lawrence River itself was Jacques Cartier. And remember guys, I mentioned Jacques Cartier in Lost at Home. He was the French explorer as early as 1535. Jacques Cartier was claiming land for the French coming down the St. Lawrence Seaway. And of course, this area was inhabited by the Iroquois Indians. Now this river is probably one of the most significant rivers in the United States. And I've even thought about this. It's possible that they came down the St. Lawrence River instead of the Bering Strait. I've often thought about reversing that theory as though they came the other way because we know for a fact, it says right here that Magogites in the 11th century were followed in the 15th and 16th century. So we know for a fact that almost a thousand years ago, Europeans had come into the St. Lawrence Seaway. So from the west side of Europe, or what we know to be the west side of Europe, the St. Lawrence Seaway would be the easiest way to traverse into our land. The earliest regular Europeans in the area were the Basques. Who were the Basque, you ask? Well, if you're watching The Smartest Beast in the Field, then you would know that those are the Jesuits. Those are all the families there in Spain. And these families are just one portion of the nations of Gog Magog. The Basque who came into the St. Lawrence River in pursuit of wells in the early 16th century. Basque whalers and fishermen traded with indigenous Americans and set up settlements, leaving vestiges all over the coast of Eastern Canada and deep into the St. Lawrence River. Fast commercial fishing activity reached its peak before the Armada Invincibles disaster in 1588, when the Spanish Basque whaling boat was confiscated by King Philip of Spain and largely destroyed. Until the early 17th century, the French used the name Riviere du Canada, some shit like that, to designate the St. Lawrence upstream to Montreal and the Ottawa River after Montreal. The St. Lawrence River served as the main route for European exploration of the North American interior, first pioneered by French explorer Samuel de Champlain. Control over the river was crucial to British strategy to capture France in the Seven Years' War. Having captured Louisbourg in 1758, the British sailed up to Quebec following the year thanks to charts drawn by James Cook. British troops were ferried via the St. Lawrence to attack the city from the west, which they successfully did at the Battle of the Plains of Abraham. The river was used by the British to defeat the French siege of Quebec under Chevalier de Levis in 1760. What was the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, you ask? It was a pivotal battle in the Seven Years' War. The battle which began on September 13, 1759 was fought on a plateau by the British Army and the Royal Navy against the French Army just outside the walls of Quebec City on land that was originally owned by a farmer named Abraham Martin, hence the name of the battle. Oh, that's what they did. They named the battle after a farmer. Not only that, this farmer was named Abraham Martin. Back in 1759, there was a guy in Canada on indigenous territory named Abraham. And the French and the Brits fought on his land. Battle of the Plains of Abraham. 
Does this story sound plausible to you? Once again, you're going to see a lot of French fuckery, specifically French fuckery, when it comes to the deception behind the entire narrative of ancient history, especially as it concerns Egypt and Babylon. Battle of the Plains of Abraham is what a battle is called, and Abraham was the farmer who owned the land. Okay, bro. Cool story. Acadia or Acadia? Acadia is a region in Canada that was actually colonized by the French. But many researchers and historians familiar with ancient history also know that Acadia or Acadia is a representative culture of the Syrian or Babylonian Empire. In fact, much of the text that is related to Babylonian script that has been attested to be related to these cultures is considered Akkadian. Here in America, we just happen to have a region in Canada named Acadia. Acadia, a colony of New France in northeastern North America that included parts of eastern Quebec, the Maritime Provinces, and modern-day Maine to the Kennebec River. The actual specification by the French government for the territory refers to lands bordering the Atlantic coast roughly between the 40th and 46th parallels. Later, the territory was divided into the French colonies that became Canadian provinces and American states. The population of Acadia included various indigenous First Nations people that comprised the Wabanaki Confederacy and descendants of French immigrants. The two communities intermarried, which resulted in a significant portion of the population of Acadia being Matisse. The first capital of Acadia, established in 1605, hmm, 1605 was Port Royal or Port Royal. A British force from Virginia attacked and burned down the town in 1613, but it was later rebuilt nearby, where it remained the longest serving capital of French Acadia until the British siege of Port Royal in 1710. Over 74 years, there were six colonial wars in which English and later British interests tried to capture Acadia starting with King William's War in 1689. During these wars, along with some of the French troops from Quebec, some Acadians, and the Wabanaki Confederacy, the French priests continually raided New England settlements along the border of Maine. While Acadia was officially conquered in 1710 during Queen Anne's War, present-day New Brunswick and much of Maine re remained contested territory. Today, the term Acadia is used to refer to regions of North America that are historically associated with lands, descendants, or culture of the former French region. There goes the hijack of the former French region. So, at this point, Acadia has been meshed into French understanding. So, this region called Acadia they're saying only has to do with French people. It particularly refers to regions of the Maritimes with French roots, language, and culture. Primary, primarily in New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Magdalen Islands, and Prince Edward Island, as well as Maine. It can be used to refer to the Acadian diaspora in southern Louisiana, a region referred to as Acadiana. In the abstract, Acadia refers to the existence of a French culture in any of these regions. People living in Acadia and sometimes former residents and their descendants are called Acadians, also later known as Cajuns. The English mispronunciation of Cadians after resettlement in Louisiana. So from the area of Mesopotamia 
and we could just say what I'm considering Mesopotamia would be the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi River from that point in Little Egypt on up. I would consider that Mesopotamia. Now going a little bit further north and to the east of the Great Lakes Basin, we're looking at the St. Lawrence River system. So I want to take a pause right here just so you guys can understand something. The way that rivers work is off topography, which means the land and or elevation by or where which the water falls determines exactly where the water is going to drain. Also, these landmarks could also be used as nation territories and borders during the allocation of lands during the table of nations uh, during the divide during the land divide so with that being said we can look at the entire North American continent an area which I say the Tower of Babel sits and you can see it from satellite and I will show it to you at the end of this video but you'll notice the continental divides here determine exactly how water is going to flow furthermore they act as natural borders in many ways I believe these to be the borders that are shared in scripture when the nations and lands were being allocated to the sons of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. With that being said, we are going to specialize right there in the Great Lake Basin, and we can see that the continental land divide that separates the United States and Canada has a few areas that you could possibly look at just to see exactly where borders are located. So, you have Mesopotamia, and then right under that, you'll see the continental divide that happens right there under the Great Lakes. Then you'll see another continental divide happening from the Labrador Sea to the Great Lakes Basin, and then all the way up to the Rocky Mountains. These borders are natural borders by which water flows, mountain ranges exist, elevation is coordinated. With that being said, I want to take a particular look at the plateau in which the Great Lakes sits. Because if I take what I know from scripture and the relative location of where I think Babylon is and I move to the north and to the east in the same direction as the stories of scripture foretell, I could possibly run into this location. Especially if I were to read, let's say, the books of Jubilees or the books of Jasher where they give us some additional context into exactly where the tower is still not really standing but where the remnants of the tower can still be seen geographically if I were to line up the location of Mesopotamia on the other side of the world and if I were to line up the location of Mesopotamia here, then I would be using approximately the same direction of travel from Babylon to Mesopotamia. So that is the parallel of the charlatan science that I'm gonna incorporate in my hypothesis of this theory. So I'm looking in particular in the area that was of the former Champlain Sea. 
Once again, the reason I am doing that is because I have identified an area that I like as Mesopotamia. Now, I have already backed that up with Egyptian artifacts, Akkadian, Assyrian, Babylonian artifacts. My friend Harry Hubbard, who says Alexander the Great is buried right there. And if you go to the biblical account, it says Alexander the Great was buried in Babylon. But there, there even have been rumors that Ptolemy had stolen the body of Alexander the Great and took it to Egypt. Nonetheless, that's either Babylon or Egypt where Harry found those artifacts. And if we were to parallel routes of travel and coordinate them with the same geography from the other side of the world, we would be roughly in the same place. So now that we're here, I think it's important for us to go back to scripture, especially some of the extra canonized sources to see if there are any gems that we can pick up that might help us on this search for the lost tower of Babel. Let's get even deeper into the hijack and you're going to start to see a few things. The origin of the designation Acadia is credited to the explorer Giovanni di Verrazzano. Hmm, really? Who on his 16th century map applied the ancient Greek name Arcadia to the entire Atlantic coast of Virginia. Arcadia derives from the Arcadia district in Greece. Hmm which since classical antiquity had the extended meanings of refuge and idyllic place. Dictionary of Canadian biography says Acadia, the name Verrazano gave to Maryland or Virginia on the account of the beauty of the trees made its first cartographical appearance in 1548. Hmm. In 1603, a colony south of the St. Lawrence River between the 40th and 46th parallels was charted by King Henry IV, who recognized the territory as Lacadi. Or Lacadi, I don't know how you say that. Lacadi? Also in the 17th century, Samuel D. Champlain fixed its present orthography with the omitted R. William Francis Ganong, a cartographer, has shown its gradual progress northeastwards in a succession of maps to its resting place in the Atlantic provinces of Canada. So that's interesting. So even when the first person who designated a certain area, Acadia, dropping the R, Verrazano, this population eventually changed and moved further north. I wonder why that is. Also of note, the similarity in the pronunciation of Akadi and the Mikamawik suffix Akadi, which means a place of abundance. The modern usage is still seen in a place such as Shunakade, meaning place of abundant cranberries. Shubnakade, meaning place of abundant wild potatoes. It is thought that intercultural conversation between early French traders and Mi'kmaq hunters have resulted in the name Acadie being changed to Lacadie. Look at the hijack right there. We read, we started off reading about the origin of Acadia is credited to Giovanni de Verrazzano in the 16th century. Reappropriating a Greek name from a district in Greece. Also, have noticed the similarity in the pronunciation of Akade and the Mi'kmaq suffix 
which means a place of abundance. The modern usage is still seen in place names such as Shunakade, meaning place of abundant cranberries, or Shubnakade, meaning place of abundant potatoes. And it is thought that intercultural conversation between early French traders and Micmac hunters may have resulted in the name being changed to Lacade. We know about all of that bullshit. So we can clearly see the hijack taking place at an etymological level. We learn in history, y'all. The expulsion of the Acadians. The expulsion of the Acadians is known as the great upheaval, the great expulsion, the great deportation, le grand derangement, was the forced removal by the British of the Acadian people from the present day Canadian maritime provinces of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Islands, and areas known as Acadia. The expulsion 1755 to 1764 occurred during the French Indian War and was part of the British military campaign against New France. The British first deported Acadians to the 13 colonies and after 1758 transported additional Acadians to Britain and France. In all of the 14,000 Acadians in the region, approximately 11,5 were deported. A census of 1764 indicates that 26 Acadians remained in the colony, presumably having eluded capture. After the British gained control of Acadia in 1713, after the French, the Acadians refused to sign unconditional oath of loyalty to become British subjects. Instead, they negotiated a conditional oath that promised neutrality. Some Acadians remained neutral and refused the unconditional oath. The difficulty was partly religious. The French Marduk, the head of the Protestant Church of England, and the Acadians were Roman Catholic. What the hell happened there? They were, I guess they had already been conquistadorized. They were also worried that signing the oath might commit male Acadians to fight against French during wartime and that would be perceived by their Mi'kmaq neighbors as acknowledgement of British claim to Acadia putting Acadian villages at risk of attack from Mi'kmaq. Other Acadians refused to sign an unconditional oath because they were anti-British. Various historians observe that some Acadians were labeled neutral when they were not. By the time of the expulsion of the Acadians, there was already a long history of political and military resistance by the Acadians, by the Acadians and the Wabanaki Confederacy to the British occupation of Acadia. The Mi'kmaq and the Acadians were allies through their Catholicism and numerous intermarriages. They resisted British occupation and were joined on numerous occasions by Acadians. These efforts were often supported and led by French priests in the region. The Wabanaki Confederacy and the Acadians fought against the British Empire in the six wars, including the French Indian War, Father Rail's War, Father Ludlutra's War, over a 75 year period. Battle of the Plains of Abraham. in an area known as Acadia. The Battle of the Plains of Abraham, also known as the Battle of Quebec, was a pivotal battle in the Seven Years' War. The battle began in 1759 and was fought on a plateau by the British Army, a Royal Navy against the French Army, just outside the walls of Quebec City on a land that was originally owned by a farmer named Abraham Martin, hence the name of the battle. That's right. The Plains of Abraham took place on the land of a farmer named Abraham. Was he Acadian? Who was this farmer? The battle began on the 13th of September 1759 and was fought on a plateau by the British Army and the Royal Navy against the French Army just outside the walls of Quebec City on a land that was originally owned by a farmer named Abraham 
Martin. Hence the name of the battle. Hmm. There's a lot of battles that have taken place over the history of time. Have any of them been named after a farmer? Any of them been named after an insignificant farmer? With not that much land, mind you. The battle involved fewer than 10,000 troops in total, but proved to be a deciding moment in the conflict between France and Britain over the fate of New France, influencing the later creation of Canada. This was the battle for Canada. The plains of Abraham were Acadia. Acadia is ancient Babylon. I found something interesting here that during this battle and when I'm reading about the first engagements, there isn't a lot of text about the Akkadians. Hmm, I wonder why. In total, Monclam had 13,390 regular troops and militia available in Quebec City and along the Beauport shore as well as 200 cavalry, 200 artillery, including the guns of Quebec, 300 native warriors, and 140 Acadian volunteers. the Jasher chapter 9 skip ahead to verse 24 and they began to make bricks and burn fires to build the city and the tower that they had imagined to complete and the building of the tower was unto them a transgression and a sin and they began to build it and whilst they were building against the Lord of heaven they imagined in their hearts to war against him and ascend into heaven and all these people and all the families divided themselves in three parts. The first said, we will ascend into heaven and fight against him. The second said, we will ascend to heaven and place our own gods there and serve them. And the third said, we will ascend to heaven and smite him with bows and spears. And the Most High knew all their works and all their evil thoughts and he saw the city and the tower which they were building and when they were building they built themselves a great city and a very high and strong tower and on account of its height the mortar and bricks did not reach the builders in their ascent to it until those had went up had completed a full year and after that they reached to the builders and gave them the mortar and bricks thus it was done daily and behold these ascended and others descended the whole day and if a brick should fall from their hands and get broken they would all weep over it and if a man fell and died none of them would look at him and the Lord knew their thoughts and it came to pass when they were building they cast the arrows toward the heavens and all the arrows fell upon them filled with blood and when they saw them they said to each other surely we have slain all those that are in heaven for this was from the Lord in order to cause them to err and in order to to destroy them off the face of the ground 
and they built the tower and the city and they did this thing daily until many days and years were elapsed and God said to the 70 angels who stood foremost before him to those who were near to him saying come let us descend and confuse their tongues that one man shall not understand the tongue of his neighbor and they did so unto them and from that day following they forgot each man his neighbor's tongue and they could not understand to speak in one tongue and when the builder took from the hands of his neighbor lime or stone which he did not order the builder would cast it away and throw it upon his neighbor that he would die and they did so many days and they killed many of them in this manner and the Lord smote the three divisions that were there and he punished them according to their works and designs those who said we will ascend to heaven and serve our gods became like apes and elephants smartest beast in the field and those who said we will smite the heaven with arrows the Lord killed them one man through the hand of his neighbor and the third division of those who said we will ascend to heaven and fight against him the Lord scattered them throughout the earth A lot of clues to the smartest beast in the field in that passage right there. And they ceased building the city and the tower. Therefore, he called that place Babel. For there the Lord confounded the language of the whole earth. Behold, it was at the east of the land of Shinar. And as to the tower which the sons of men built, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up to one third part thereof. And a fire also descended from heaven and burned another third. And the other third is left to this day. And it is part of which was aloft. And its circumference is three days walk and many of the sons of men died in that tower a people without number now one of the great things of the British Museum is that Robert Caldivay uh, brought over a lot of the bricks that were discovered in ancient Babylon. There is a room in the British Museum that is probably twice the length of this room. And there is a cabinet up against the wall for its full length. And I think from memory there are three ledges. And in that cabinet are just hundreds of bricks with Nebuchadnezzar's inscription. Now if you go around the Metropolitan Museum, there is one big room with one brick. And all the Americans go, ooh. <laughs> That's amazing. And I'm going, go to the British Museum. <laughs> um, that is true. That is true. Um, but there is Nebuchadnezzar's imprint, his inscription. This was a man. And we're going to look at that tomorrow, God willing. This was a man who loved himself, who loved his city. This was Babylon that he had built. And until the end of the 19th century, none of these things had been discovered. You imagine, for the first time, you're Robert Caldivet, and you find hundreds of these bricks that have... Nebuchadnezzar's name in. It was an extraordinary find. Ha! Uh, ha! Uh, bitch, hold my phone. So you expect me to believe? After a fire from heaven and half the tower is swallowed up, these niggas find a perfectly inscribed brick from the tower. Houseway. For all we know, the destruction of the tower was an extinction level event. Shout out Buster Rhymes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Speaking of yeah, that was an extinction level event. Damn near, I mean, people lived. But we're talking about a massive. 
actor, the most hot. Book of Jubilees, chapter 10. Jump ahead to verse 25. For this reason, the whole land of Shinar is called Babel, because the Lord did there confound all the language of the children of men, and from thence they were dispersed into their cities, each according to his language and his nation. And the Lord sent a mighty wind against the tower and overthrew it upon the earth. And behold, it was between Ashur and Babylon in the land of Shinar and they called its name Overthrow in the fourth week in the first year in the beginning thereof in the fourth and thirteenth jubilee they were dispersed from the land of Shinar Ham and his sons went into the land which he was to occupy which he acquired as his portion in the land of the south. And Canaan saw the land of Lebanon to the river of Egypt, that it was very good. And he went not into the land of his inheritance to the west, the sea. And he dwelt in the land of Lebanon, eastward and westward, from the border of Jordan and from the border of of the sea this is interesting what we have here are almost two contrasting stories of what actually happened to the tower in the book of Jasher it states that a fire from heaven and it was swallowed by earth however in Jubilees it says the Lord sent a mighty wind against the tower and overthrew it upon the earth so these are contradicting stories but are they is their truth mutually exclusive to each account as i was looking for stories of really what happened to the tower these were the most detailed in which i could be able to find that i would consider truth so now I see as a three day circumference was the part of the tower that was aloft. In my mind, I'm imagining that being the top part of the tower. So the question would be, did the top of the tower always remain? And if so, wouldn't a fire from heaven destroy the top of the tower? Not to mention the bottom of the tower being swallowed by the whole earth. The circumference, which allows me to believe that the tower was in the shape of a circle. So now is the moment of truth. I do not want to waste any more of your time, even though I'm not wasting your time. But I'm just as excited to tell you as I hope you are about finding out this location. So after doing what I think is diligent research I found a spot in Quebec Canada that is indistinguishable from any other place on earth this place just happens to be found in a land formerly known as Acadia the circumference of this massive can't miss crater in Canada is approximately a three day walk the place that I'm talking about is Lake Manicougan Quebec Canada now let's go for the clincher this crater on Earth can be seen from space. According to scientists, 218 million years ago, an asteroid went boom. Right there in a perfect circle. A perfect circular stroid. 
a circle destroyed. The cherry on top of this charlatan heathen Sunday. The name within this lake, the mountain which sits within the waters of this very distinctive crater that has created its own moat within the earth. The name of the highest point on this astronomical island is called Mount Babel. That's right, Mount Babel. In a land formerly known as Acadia. Of which an asteroid murdered the scene. Debris is said to be found from Canada as far as Wait for it. Europe. Mount Babel. The disbursement of those who wanted to transgress all had unique elements post Babel. They abandoned the tower and the tower got struck down. According to Jasher, a three day circumference. So now, let's look into the specifics of exactly what I'm talking about. Mount Babel is the highest peak of the Rene Levasseur Island at just over 3,000 feet above sea level, which is 1,900 feet above the Manicougan Reservoir level. It lies within the Louis Babel Ecological Reserve in Quebec, Canada. The mount is named after Catholic missionary Louis Babel, who is said to have converted the indigenous tribes. Mount Babel is a central peak of the Manicougan Crater and was formed by the rebound of the crust after the impact of a meteor 210 million years ago. The mountain and reservoir are of a particular interest to geologists due to the shock metamorphosis it endured. Again we read the crater is a multiple ring structure about 60 miles across with the reservoir 40 mile diameter inner ring being the most prominent feature okay so the reservoir has a diameter of 40 miles well if the reservoir is 40 miles across and we calculate the radius diameter and then circumference of that exact distance you're approximately somewhere around 100 miles give or take a few well let's see here the average person can walk a 25 mile marathon in roughly eight hours which means in just eight hours on three days you would go 75 miles if you were to travel at that same pace for approximately 10 to 12 hours a day, you would traverse the entire island in three days. That's more than just a coincidence. Now let's do some math here. According to scripture, the height of the tower was 5,433 cubits. So, at 5,433 cubits multiplied by 1.5 feet, you're looking at a building that was around 8,149 feet. 8,149.5 feet to be exact. So, approximately 8,150, 
Well, we know that a third of the tower still stands. So now that we know exactly or approximately how tall the tower is, all we really need to do is take 8150 and divide that by three to know what one third of the remaining height is. Well, one third of the remaining height is 2,716 feet. Okay, so one third of the tower, one third of the remaining height of the tower, we know is 2,700 feet. So how tall is Mount Babel? Well, let's just look and see how tall Mount Babel is. So one third of 8,150 feet is approximately 2,700 feet. Well, just so happens that the height of Mount Babel is 3,123 feet. But know this, 1,936 of those feet are above sea level, which means that there actually is a little more space to add more height. But the water level of the reservoir hides the rest of the visible tower. So there you have it. The ancient remnants of the Tower of Babel lie in the mists of the Acadian or Canadian wilderness. Before the land was first colonized by the French, beginning with Jacques Cartier, the native tribes of this territory called the land Acadie, meaning abundant. If we were to compare the terrain of Iraq to Canada, which place would we consider more abundant? Isaiah 11.15 states from the Berean Study Bible, The Lord will devote to the destruction the gulf of the Egyptian sea. With a scorching wind, he will sweep his hand over the Euphrates. He will split it into seven streams. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who remain from Assyria, as there was for Israel when they came up out of the land of Egypt. And the King James Version states, and the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it in the seven streams, and make men go over dry shine. In the Christian Standard Bible, the Egyptian sea was changed to the Gulf of Suez. In the contemporary English version, the Egyptian sea was changed to the Red Sea. But Isaiah clearly states the Egyptian Sea. In fact, it states the Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian Sea. The tongue in this example is referring to the mouth of the river, which empties into the Egyptian Sea. Well, the current location of the Euphrates empties into the Persian Gulf, which is not or has ever been referred to as 
the Egyptian Sea. The Persian Gulf is on the other side of Arabia. Biblical scholars no doubt ran into this problem generations ago. So when their charlatan attempts to fit a square peg into a round hole, they just falsified the text. Because their natural sense of geography knows that the Euphrates in Iraq does not flow into their fabricated idea of what they think the Egyptian sea is. Furthermore, it shows even more ignorance in comprehension of scripture as the Egyptian Sea and the Red Sea are described as two different bodies of water throughout Scripture. The Euphrates is not mentioned in the proximity of the Red Sea in the Exodus account, yet entire books of the Torah detail stories during the exodus and the Euphrates does not play a role. Also, the Euphrates does not have seven natural tributaries. It has five. The river begins with water runoff from the mountains of Turkey, which drain down to the lowest elevation near Basra and empties into the Persian Gulf. Quote, once the Euphrates enters Iraq, there are no more natural boundaries. Although canals connecting the Euphrates Basin with the Tigris Basin exist. So how could this river be the Euphrates? These pseudo-historians fail to address this obvious contradiction, which only highlights the true essence of their wickedness. They actively participate in the role of deceiving the nations and are therefore accountable for the lies they propagate. Ancient Assyrian artifacts have been found throughout the last few hundred years across the entirety of the Great Lakes region. Why are there so many remnants of ancient Assyria in America if the Assyrians never even knew of such a place? These mutatus mutandus deviations from the truth are the foundation of their false knowledge. And as I speak, that foundation is crumbling beneath their feet. <laughs>